Well, we are coming this morning to one of the most popular, or at least well-known and influential passages in all of the Bible, the Ten Commandments. And I don't say that glibly. They really have had historical influence. Just give you a brief, brief proof, brief history lesson. Historically, in the church, the Ten Commandments has been a key part of our regular instruction. Through most of church history, the church has has used uh, catechism as the primary means of teaching Bible truth, what it means to be a Christian. Are we familiar with catechism? Catechism is simply a teaching method where you ask a question and give the answer to the question. And various branches of the church created their own catechisms over the centuries. But what remained consistent in each of those different catechisms was that they tended to focus on three things. They tended to focus on the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, which is an ancient document from about 150 A.D., not written by the Apostles, but a a creed that declared what the Apostles believed and spoke, so the basics of Christian doctrine. And then the third thing that these catechisms focused on was the Ten Commandments. Let me give you an idea of how much they focused on the Ten Commandments. Uh, We've all probably heard of the Westminster Confessions. Of the 107 questions in the Westminster Catechism, 42 of them focus on the Ten Commandments. You've heard of the Heidelberg Catechism. The Heidelberg Catechism was divided into 52 sections with the intention that you could read one section each Lord's Day. Of the 52 sections, 11 of them are about the Ten Commandments. So clearly the church throughout our history has considered the Ten Commandments a critical part of our discipleship a critical part of what it means for us to be Christian. So it's not all that surprising then to realize that those commandments that were so influential and so front and center in the teaching of the church would play a large role in Western society at large. The Western society that was predominantly Christianized for hundreds of years The Ten Commandments kind of became interwoven into the very fabric of our society. Let me give you one illustration of this. On top of our Supreme Court building, there is a marble carving of ancient lawgivers. It's on the east wall. Among these lawgivers, you have Confucius on one hand. On the other hand, you have a man named Solon, who was a uh, a Grecian. He was an Athenian lawgiver. But right between them, seated in a large chair with stone tablets in either hand, is Moses. So Moses, the lawgiver of Israel, with his Ten Commandments, overseeing our judicial system. Seems a bit ironic, doesn't it? After, was it 15 years ago and the conversation about should the Ten Commandments belong anywhere on government-owned public property? He's carved onto our building. The significance of that cannot be overlooked. The importance of the Ten Commandments has largely been recognized by the general public as well. It's not as if the Ten Commandments were just like this this specialized, you know, for the elites and those in government. The general public has generally been in favor of the Ten Commandments. As a matter of fact, 
As recently as 2018, there was a poll that revealed that 90% of America believes that at least some of the commandments, like murder, stealing, and lying, like don't do those things, are still relevant for today. About 60%, of course, right? We're all thankful for that. We're running around killing each other. Although lying is on the decline, just FYI, in that poll. Uh, lying is a much lower percentage in the 90s than the other two, and in rapid decline. But here's the one that got me. About 60% of the American population still believe that the first three commandments are important and relevant for us today. You remember the first three? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any carved images to bow down to worship them. And you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. I just suspected that those three would be a much lower percentage than 60%. Yet, in spite of their historic significance, and in spite of their popularity, the reality is we simply do not know the Ten Commandments. I mean, to the basic level of we don't even really know what they are. Let me give you another poll, because those are fun. A poll in 2012 revealed that Americans were more likely to be able to name all seven ingredients of the Big Mac than they were to be able to name all 12 of the, or all 12 of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> you know, I almost wrote that last night as I was going back over my notes and making some edits. I almost put 12. I don't know why 12 is in my head. I'm just helping to drive home the point that we don't even know them. We don't even know how many commandments there are in the Ten Commandments. I don't even know. Apparently there's ten. Let's stick with that. Did I make my point yet? Get this. In 2012, more Americans could name all of the children in the Brady Bunch than could name all ten of the Ten Commandments. Which is astounding, because we're only 11 years from that, and half of you don't even know who the Brady Bunch are. Right? At least not if you're under 20. We, we don't know them, and we certainly don't value them the way that we should. Society, though they are willing to admit the value of at least most of these commandments... Their admission stops with, with recognizing that they have some moral good, that they're, they're a moral code that is generally good to live by. It's beneficial to society if you follow these commands in general. But society is much less willing to recognize that these Ten Commandments come from the heart of the Creator God and are intended for His glory, as well as for our good. So if we are to properly recognize the value of the Ten Commandments, we need to consider a few things before we actually get to the commands. And here's where you go, oh no, like we know how this is going to turn out, right? Like Ten Commandments isn't going to happen in one week. And as a matter of fact, we're going to spend most of the morning laying the foundation to help us receive the Ten Commandments properly, all right? So with that, I'm going to lay out, and, and, and just here's how the, the sermon is going to go. I'm going to lay out a few threads for us, just some information that we need to know about what the Ten Commandments are and what their relationship is to us. And then, Lord willing, at the end, we're going to get into one verse of Exodus chapter 20 that is going to help us tie all of this together, all right? So here's thread number one, and this is the context of the, uh, the Ten Commandments at general, the context. In other words, what is the bigger picture of what God intends to do through these commands with Israel? So when we start in Exodus chapter 20... Understand that what God is doing is not just giving a bunch of rules to Israel. 
he is actually laying out for his people the stipulations of a covenant that he is entering into with his people. So if we were to skip ahead in the Pentateuch to Deuteronomy chapter 5, it says this in verse number 1, Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak in your hearing today, and you shall learn them and be careful to do them. The Lord your God, and here's why, the Lord your God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Horeb is just another name for Sinai. Not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us who are here alive today. In other words, Moses understood that what is happening in Exodus chapter 20 with the giving of the Ten Commandments is not just rules to live by, they are covenant between God and his people. They understood this in Exodus. A few chapters later in Exodus 24, verse number 7, it says, then he took the book of the covenant. What was that? That was the Ten Commandments, and he read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. What is that? That is the ratification of the covenant. God comes to his people and says, here is the agreement I am putting in place between me and you. Here are the expectations that I have of my people. And if you abide by these expectations, here is what you can, abide, or here's what you can expect from me. They are stipulations of a covenant, of an agreement. It's going to govern the relationship between God and his people. Now also interesting, in the context of really the entire scripture, they are never referred to as the Ten Commandments by the scripture. They're actually called, they're referred to as the Ten Words. You may have heard them referred to occasionally as the Decalogue. It literally means the ten words. In fact, again, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, uh, Moses is going to repeat the ten words to God's people. And he says, these ten words are, are, are what God gave you at the mountain. Why is this important? You see it in Exodus chapter 20, verse number 1. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, why is it significant? Well, first of all, it's not a problem, I don't think, to call them commands, because they are actually commands. So calling them the Ten Commandments is describing kind of how they, you know, the, it, it is what they are. But understanding that they're not laid out as simply rules to abide by, that there's something more than that. And I think it helps us to understand the nature of, of what the Ten Commandments were meant to be. And here's how I think they function in this covenant. I think the Ten Commandments, what we get in Exodus chapter 20, are more like the national constitution for Israel. In other words, these ten words are, are foundational for the covenant, for the nation themselves. All further regulation that's going to come is going to depend in some way on these ten words. They're going to derive their authority from these ten words. It's not all that different from what we have in the United States, right? We have a constitution, right? Remember, we the people, right? We have banded together to create this nation for our good, right? For our flourishing. And all of the federal laws that we have in this country depend upon the Constitution for their validity and for their authority, right? The Constitution is what is foundational to our existence as a nation. It formulated us as a nation. All of the rules flow out from that Constitution. Consider this, Exodus chapter 21. You can, you can kind of skim down if you've got your Bibles open. Exodus 21, in verse number 1, after the giving of the Ten Commandments, here's what God says to Moses for Israel. Now these are the rules that you shall set before them. So we have ten words, and then after those words, 
God's like, here's the rules that you're going to live by. So what we have here is more than just a set of commandments, though they are commands. What we have is the beginning of a covenant that is going to govern the relationship between God and the people that he has rescued. These ten words serve as something like a constitution to which all of the other laws will connect and ultimately find their purpose and authority. Okay, there's thread number one. Thread number two, let's talk about the structure of these Ten Commandments. Many people have recognized that there are essentially two tablets of commands. There is one set of commands that begin with the first one. It's, it's commands one through four that essentially focus our attention on our relationship with God, right? And, and I'll kind of show you as we get into the commands how that functions, I think, verse, uh, I think command number four, by the way, serves as a bridge between the commands about how we are to relate to God and the second tablet, which is a series of commands from five to ten that describe our relationship with each other, that governs our relationship with one another. So we have a, a vertical set of commands. How do we relate to God? And then we have this command, number four, that's like, on the Sabbath day, you're supposed to rest, and that rest has to do with our fellowship with God, but it is done in community with one another, which helps then lay the groundwork for this, uh, this horizontal relationship between us, which is the final six commands. Jesus recognized these two categories, by the way. Remember Matthew 22, when someone asked him, what is the greatest commandment? In his answer, which, which he gives as two laws, one that comes from Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, the other comes from Leviticus 19, 18, and what does he say? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. This is the first commandment, and the second is like to it. You shall, like, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Those two commands, Jesus says, summarize the law and the Ten Commandments kind of fit perfectly into those two categories. But then what does Jesus say about those two commands? He says, on these two commands, all the law and the prophets depend. They hang on these two. In other words, without these ideas, without love for God and love for one another, it's really difficult to make sense of much of the Old Testament. Of all the 600 plus rules and regulations that God is going to give to Israel, if we don't have love, if we don't understand the foundation of love to the law, then they really become meaningless. It's no wonder then that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong and clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but I have not love, I gain nothing. I want you to understand two things from this. Number one, the Old Testament is not that different from the New Testament. The foundation of all that Israel was to be was bound up in the Ten Commandments, which ultimately was reduced to these two, uh, these two ideas. Love God and love each other. And you fast forward to the New Testament, and what do we have? Love God and love each other. So there's our second thread. Thread number three kind of builds on the left. What then is the relationship between law and God's people? Let's start with Israel. The laws that were given to Israel, both the Ten Commands, the Ten Words, and all of the 600 plus regulations that are coming, we're not about making God happy. Nor were they about making people miserable. 
the law has a couple of purposes. I, I want to give you two that I want us to focus in on. There are probably a couple others that are we could maybe flesh out of these two. But I think there are two basic purposes for the Old Testament law with Israel. Number one, the law was intended to protect them from danger. Listen to the words of the psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. In other words, the psalmist says the word of God, the law of God, is something like a guardian. It protects us from impurity. Now, where else have we seen the law and the idea of guardian connected in the scripture? Well, we find it in Paul, don't we? Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. So then, the law was our guardian. And, and we object at this point. Because guardians to us typically mean restrictions, right? Guardians mean oversight and, and restrictions of my freedom, limitations of our freedom. We, we associate limits with misery. So all already in our minds we're going, yeah, yeah, guardian, like we get it. Law is miserable, right? What, what do we want? We want freedom. When do we want it? We want it now, right? But, but listen again. Let, let's go back to Psalm 119 again. Psalm 119, verse 44. Listen to this. I will keep your law continually forever and ever, and I shall walk in a wide place because I have sought your precepts. Precepts is another word for laws. Well, well that's... It's completely incongruous. It doesn't make any sense. Laws are restrictions, and yet to the psalmist, the law was what gave him a wide place to live in, to walk around in. How does that make any sense? It's because the law is a guardian. The law is like the high protective fence, the high protective walls that keeps us from running into danger. It's like if you picture the, the kingdom of God, if you picture like the Christian life as a plateau on top of a mountain with very steep sides, where do you not want to go if you live on that plateau? You don't want to go very near the edges, right? Especially if you have a fear of heights. I want nothing to do with the edges, right? What do we want? What do we need? If I am to run around on that plateau in full freedom, without fear, I need a boundary, right? What the psalmist understood, what, what Israel was supposed to understand, and what we are supposed to understand, is that the law was not meant to make people miserable. The law was meant to make people fearless and free. To set them in a wide space. Kind of, like a, kind of like the fence you put around in your yard. Particularly when you have kids that are little. Or you got dogs. Which for some of you, those are your kids, right? I get it. Throw them in. Why do we put the fence around? Because we want them to be able to run and to play freely without always having to be concerned about ending up in the street. It's protection. That's what the law was intended to do for God's people. But not only protection, it was meant to reshape God's people from being slaves in the slave mentality into being sons. To think with the mindset of a son. How does a son of God function in this life? The laws were there to help reshape God's people into sons, which is what we said is the theme of Exodus all along. It was God who rescues slaves and turns them into sons. That's what he does. And the law is a means by which that transformation, that reshaping is going to happen in Israel. So we become sons. After being slaves, 
for centuries, we have questions, right? How should sons relate to their father? Well, we've got commands that lay that out. There are laws, one through four. Here is how you honor your father. How should you act toward our siblings? How, how should we act towards one another? Well, we got some laws for that too. Take a look at commands five through ten. How should, we teach, how should we treat strangers? There are laws for that. Not to make you miserable, but to help you understand the heart of God. To help you understand the character of God so that we might better reflect. In other words, we're not left guessing what God wants. I would argue, folks, there's nothing more miserable than to have an authority over you that you feel like you always have to guess what that authority wants out of you. That's not freedom. That's misery. Much better to, man, give me some guidelines. Just tell me what you want. For an Israelite who understand or understood the 600 plus laws that God gave them correctly, what they understood was that these laws were a blessing from God to his people, revealing his heart, telling them what the expectations are. How do we operate as sons? God, we need your input. We need to hear from you. And this is why the psalmist then, back in Psalm 119, can say something like this. Verse number 20 says, My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. Now, have you ever read that? And wondered, what kind of loser must David have been? Right? I mean, who geeks out on rules? What kind of weirdo is that? You love to meditate on rules? Or maybe you've read that. Or maybe you've just heard it for the first time, and, and maybe it leaves you wondering what you're missing. Because deep down you know David's on to something. And you have this gnawing feeling that he's getting something here that you don't see. And what David got, folks, that many people miss, is that the law was not there to make him miserable. It was there to help him understand what it meant for him to be a son of God. How to really love and relate to God. And how to show the world that he belongs to God. But here's the objection. What about us? Right, because we're New Testament Christians, and we know, right, the law doesn't apply to us. So what do we do then? How do we, as God's people, today relate to the law? In light of Hebrews 8.13, where the, the author of Hebrews says, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. It's done. It's over. It's finished. It's obsolete. Or in Galatians 3, which we've been reading through uh, recently in our scripture reading on Sunday morning. Now, before faith came, Paul says, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. In other words, remember, the law was the fence. It imprisoned us for our own protection. Not in a tiny, dark, miserable dungeon, but in a wide place for us to roam freely and fearlessly. But then in verse 25, Paul, Paul says, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Right? We are sons of God through faith. Not keeping the law. There's an important distinction there. So let me ask you this question. Does that mean then, does Paul intend for us to take away from this idea, the Old Testament, the old law, the old covenant is over. We are under new covenant. We are not under law. We are under grace. Does that mean then that we are now antinomian? Which is a really fancy word, right? I saw all the faces. Really fancy word that literally means without law. Are we lawless people? Is that what the New Testament intends for us to understand? 
The answer is no. Are you free to do whatever you desire? Oh, that's a trickier question. Because in one sense, I would say yes. And I would base that on Jeremiah 31. And I would base that on Ezekiel 36. And I would base that on Ephesians 4.24. And I would base that on Psalm 37.4. You can read all that later, right? And all that essentially says that in the new covenant, God is going to give you a new heart. And he's going to write his law on your heart. And on top of that, he's going to give you his spirit. Then he's going to give you the desires of your heart if you delight in him, right? So in that regard, you are free to follow your desires, Christian. The problem is that we don't always delight ourselves. in The problem is that we quench the Holy Spirit, and that messes with our desires, doesn't it? So you're free to live as you want, provided these two things are true of you, you have a new heart and you're submitting yourself to the rule of the Holy Spirit. So, we are truly free for freedom. Christ has set you free. But not in a way that is without law. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says to the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, those who were the Jews, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law. I am not under the old covenant. But then he says in verse 21, to those outside the law, the Gentiles, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. In other words, Here's the distinction that I think is helpful. The law as given in Exodus and Leviticus and reiterated in Deuteronomy and repeated throughout the Old Testament. That law was intended for a nation of people, the Israelites. How should we govern ourselves as sons of God? God's like, I'm not going to leave you guessing about that. I'm just going to tell you. Here it is. Well, we're not the nation of Israel. We are the church. So we are not under that law. We are under the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ then? That's the, that's the relevant question. What is that? Well, in John 13, 34, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Well, that sounds like there's an awful lot of connection points between that and, and the tables of the Ten Commandments, right? It's love. John's going to pick up on this and, and expound on it a little bit in his, uh, in his first epistle. 1 John 2.7, he says, Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you. And then you know what he goes on to talk about? Love each other and love God, not the world. In other words, folks, he's like, hey, it's an old commandment because, I mean, God told you in the Ten Commandments, love each other. But it's a new commandment because in some ways it's never old. And it's a new, a new commandment because Jesus has reiterated it as the foundation of our faith in him. So the covenant of Sinai. And all of its regulations are not binding for Christians. We don't sacrifice lambs. We don't visit a temple. All those things are done, fulfilled in Christ. However, we are not lawless people. And God has written his law in our hearts, the law of Christ, which is summarized as love for God and love for neighbor, the same summary as is given to the Ten Commandments. So what does that mean for us as we approach this? I'll give you two thoughts. Number one, we should seek to understand the character of God through these commands. These commands given to Israel are based on the character of who God is. If you still are open to Exodus chapter 20, look at verse number two. I am the Lord your God who has brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. In other words, everything I am about to command you is based on who I am talk more about that in just a moment as we as we wrap this stuff up second thing number one seek to understand the character of god through the law number two we should seek to abide by those laws 
that carry over to the New Testament. We've already, already seen thematically the Ten Commandments carry over. Love, that's the foundation. But you will also find specifically that nine out of the Ten Commandments are specifically repeated in the New Testament. There's only one that isn't. We'll talk about that when we get there. Hold you in suspense if you don't know which one it is. In other words, folks, these Ten Commands that were foundational to Israel are also fundamental truths about how we today can still love God and love each other. Let me give you one example from Romans chapter 13. Paul says in verse number 8, Owe no one anything except to love each other. There's our foundation. Love each other. That's what you owe each other. For the one who loves has fulfilled the law. For the commandments... You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, the New Testament does not lessen the impact of the Ten Commandments. In any, if anything, it heightens the impact of the Ten Commandments. You are sons of God. This is what you must be. This is who you must be. This is how you must act. Now with that, there's all of our threads laid out in front of us, right? With that, I want us to look quickly at the first two verses of Exodus chapter 20. All right? We have a covenant. God is beginning the giving of that covenant to his people. And most good covenants begin with what? begin with a preamble, don't they? So we as a church, we have a constitution. There's a preamble to our constitution. We, the members of Holiday Bible Church, having placed our faith solely in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, having been baptized following our salvation, and accepting the Bible as the inspired and inerrant word of God do band together as a local expression of the body of Christ. This document declares our beliefs and the procedures that will help us to accomplish the Lord's work. That's the preamble. The United States Constitution has a preamble. We, the people, in order to form a more perfect union, to provide for the common defense and to ensure ourselves and to our posterity domestic tranquility, do ordain and establish the Constitution of the United States of America. Preamble. Verses 1 and 2 of Exodus chapter 20 is the preamble to the foundational Constitution of Israel. Look at verse number one. God spoke all these words. In other words, keep this in mind as we're going through these, by the way. God is speaking to Israel here, not just Moses. That becomes very clear at the end of the chapter. This is not Moses on the mountaintop getting the tablets right now. This is God on the mountain and Israel surrounding and the booming voice like thunder coming out of the mountain to the point that Israel is eventually like, uh, Moses, why don't you go on up there? Because we're terrified. We don't want to hear any more directly from God. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now, there's the preamble, and there is a glaring difference between this preamble and the preamble to our United States Constitution. Because this is not the kind of arrangement where people band together to set up a kingdom and to choose their king. This is an arrangement from God himself. I am the Lord your God. Here is my covenant with you. There is no bartering. There is no banding together. There is no will of the populace. There is sovereign king giving and making covenant with his subject. I have the right to lay out these stipulations because I am your God and I rescued you. Folks, I, let me just say this. I think we should be very careful with language like, hey, you should just let God. Or, hey, you know what you, know what you need? You need to make God Lord of your life. Hey, listen, those are phrases I've been guilty of, but those are not entirely accurate statements. He is God. He is Lord of your life, whether you recognize it or not. 
He is already king, whether you recognize it or not. We do not make him any of those things. We do not allow him sovereignty over our lives. We're not the ones who, 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 who give him the right to rule. We are the ones who must change. We are the ones who must agree to his covenant or we die in our rebellion. So maybe we should substitute those types of phrases with ones that emphasize our need to change. Maybe we should say things like, you know what you need? What you need is to submit to God's control. You need to trust his control. Or, or you need to recognize that God is Lord over your life. This preamble establishes the right of God to rule, and it does it in two ways. God's kingship is claimed based on two realities. The first reality is the reality of creation. The second reality is the reality of their redemption. And these are the two main reasons why we need to know, value, and obey the Ten Commandments. Because God is God. The Lord, Yahweh, is God. I think this does two things. I am God. Well, who is God? The Israelites would have known from the first book that Moses wrote. In the beginning, God created. That is most fundamentally who he is. He is creator. I made you, therefore I have rights over you. He is Yahweh. That's the name, remember, that he gave to Moses on the mountaintop, the burning bush. I am that I am, which means the eternal, self-existent, self-sufficient creator, the one from whom all existence exists. This is who you have to reckon with, and this is what you have to decide. Is there a God to whom I am responsible? But please understand, I say that you've got to decide that not because his existence depends on your decision and not because your decision can hold him at bay or prevent his plans from you. Remember, he is God. He does as he pleases. So you may choose to disbelieve, but it is to your own destruction. Such a decision would no more save you from God's wrath than closing your eyes at the beach as the tsunami crashes onto the shore. You can close your eyes and pretend like it's not coming, but it's coming nonetheless. It is real nonetheless. He is God. He is king. He has the right to command. Because he is your creator. But he is also redeemer. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Out of the house of slavery. Again, two things that I think this emphasizes to Israel. N number one, look, Israel, look at where you are. You are not in Egypt anymore. You're not a slave anymore. You are at Sinai. You're at the mountain of God. You are my treasured possession. You think these Ten Commands are unfair? You think all these rules you're about to receive are too much? Remember where you were. We go, oh man, all these commands we have to follow, all these commands that Christians have to follow, it's too much. Yet the Bible says his commands are not burdensome. Yet I can direct your attention to the United States of America and I can tell you that between 1995 and 2016, you know how many rules and regulations, federal rules and regulations were passed just between 1995 and 2016? Try 88,819. As a matter of fact, I, I heard, I was trying to verify this last night, but I heard in 2008, the government, the Congress asked the, uh, a government research uh, group to, to figure out how many laws, rules, and regulations are on the books in the United States of America. They came back and said, we do not have the time nor the manpower to accomplish such a task. And they came back with that answer five years later. <laughs> 
And yet we look at God and go, it's too much. Oh. Folks, what God has done in giving us commands is to give us freedom. It's to allow us to maintain our freedom because we can now live as humans were intended to live. Remember the mountaintop with Adam and Eve, the garden, walking with God in the cool of the day, but then sin came and there was exile. Well, God has reversed exile. God has redeemed his people out of slavery. And it is these commands that help reshape us into the sons that we were intended to be. This is what humans were meant to be. Freedom, folks, is not anarchy. Law is there to make sure we don't lose our freedom. Like the fish that wants out of the fishbowl. The minute he gets out of the fishbowl, all freedom is gone. Because he can no longer function as a fish is intended to function. He is now dead. So look at where you are. I brought you out. You remember how you got here. I brought you out. I brought you here. I did it. I am your redeemer. And folks, it is very important as we go through these laws over the coming weeks, it is very important to remember grace, redemption came before law. God, by himself, Hearing Israel's cry. Remembering his covenant with Abraham. Seeing their distress. Knowing the trouble that they were in. And knowing already that it would be he by himself. Who would rescue. Psalm 100 verse 3 says know that the Lord he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. He has rights over us by virtue of the fact that he is creator. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. He has rights over us by virtue of redemption. But we didn't get here by keeping laws. The law can show us our need of Christ, but it is not a substitute for Christ. Salvation comes by grace through faith. We happen to live under a different covenant than Israel. But their covenant pointed toward the coming of a Messiah who would bring about the ultimate redemption. And with the price of his own blood, he would become our redeemer. Let's pray. Lord, this is but a scratching of the surface. In some ways, this is just a foundational sermon that by your grace prepares us to receive hard words that are coming. And Lord, we must understand that simply because these words are in the Old Testament does not mean that they are irrelevant for us. They are not. But also, just because they are not irrelevant for us does not mean that they are burdensome or miserable. They also are not. There is freedom to be found in the law of Christ. And so we pray that you would prepare our hearts We pray that you would change our hearts. Lord, cause us to be people who love your law. So much that we meditate in it day and night. And thus become like a tree planted by the rivers of water whose leaf will not wither. But who will produce fruit. God, strengthen your people. We ask these things in Jesus' name.